Okay, let's go ahead and get started and, and, and um, other people may join us as we come. Well, first of all, welcome to all of you who are here. My name is Terry Wiesihan. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations at IU East. And um, this was passed to, to kind of help um, engage more IU East alumni in the area. So welcome to any IU and IU East alumni who are here. You know, the, if you've been to Zoom meetings before, you know, please don't forget to, to mute yourself in case you know, fire truck or the dog barks, which can happen, uh, or, or other things that can happen. So please don't, don't forget to, uh, please mute yourself while the presentation's going on. Um, I would like to introduce Roxy Deer, if you don't know Roxy. Roxy has been assisting us with this program. She is the Director of Professional Development at the Wayne County Chamber of Commerce, and I'm gonna let Roxy have a few words here. Thank you for introducing me, Terry. My name is Roxy Deer. Like Terry said, I work at the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and I'm also the co-chair for Hype Wayne County, which serves everyone um, 21 to 40 in our community um, with various aspects um, from professional development to social development, um, but also any, we're working on recruiting and retaining young professionals to our community. We know that um, we're needed in the community for business development and long-term strategic planning. So making sure we have the skills and the network to develop um, and move our our community forward. So I'm excited about tonight. I'm I'm hoping more young professionals can jump on. If not, that they'll listen to this later because I think this is a very important topic. Thank you, Roxy. And right as soon as I said that, a siren started driving by, so I had to <laughs> mute myself. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce Dr. Oilan Chung. Um, Oilan is Associate Professor of Finance working for the School of Business and Economics at IU East. She is the Discipline Coordinator for, the economic and for Economics and Finance and overseeing the curricula for our undergraduates for their business degrees um, in the business program. In addition, she serves as a Director of the IU East Business and Economic Research Center. She conducts an annual East Central Indiana Business Survey, represents IU East at the Kelly School Business Outlook Forum. And she writes the Richmond Forecast Report, which is published in the Indiana Business Review. She also maintains the IU East Regional Business Confidence Index and writes the annual East Central Indiana Business Survey that is released on her center website each year. She's a very busy woman and she teaches classes too. So she's a very busy woman. Uh, Dr. Chung is the uh, founding this Adulting 101 program in the fall of 2008 and is a continuing partner of the program. And I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Chung to give us a few words. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Oileen Chung. Um, I also go by Iwin. I hope you all are doing great. First of all, I would like to thank you all for your participation in this event. Uh, it has been a year that we finally can we start this uh, community outreach initiative. Thanks to all the great efforts of Roxy and Terry that we can virtually meet for this event, although not physically at a local restaurant as in our first generation of this IUE's Adulting 101 program without a pandemic. But we are meeting here. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this first event for this evening and certainly more events for the program will be coming before long. I'm sure you folks are now very eager on watching Dr. Endel's presentation and interacting with her after that during the Q&A time. Let me pass the time back to Terry for the, for the Zoom housekeeping reminders and her introduction of Dr. Endel. Thank you so much, Oilan, thank you. Um, as I said, just some housekeeping things following the presentation, we'll be doing some question and answer. You just go ahead and type those in to the chat box if you have questions. I know I personally have some questions that, that I would like to pose. Um, uh, first of all, I want to tell you that I found Dr. Andale on Facebook, not, not in a creepy way, in a way because there was an article from Indiana University where she talked about workplace and surviving the pandemic in the workplace, and this light bulb went off, and I thought, wouldn't she be perfect for this, this um, presentation that we were having? So I contacted her, and she graciously said she would, she would join us tonight. Um, Stephanie Andale is a Assistant Professor of Psychology at IUPUI. She received her PhD in Industrial and Organizational Psychology from the University of South Florida. Her research focuses on employee health and well-being 
employee safety performance and technology in the workplace. She, her work has been published in various academic journals such as the Journal of Vocational Behavior, Work Stress, and Computers in Human Behavior. Additionally, her work has been featured in a number of media outlets such as Business Insider, Fast Company, PBS NewsHour, and the BBC, and on Facebook too. So. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Ann Dale. I'm going to let you take it from here, and as I said, we will be posing some questions later on. Perfect. Thank you so much, Terry. And let me see if I can, um, is there any way I can share my screen? I think if I am, uh, if you make me a co-host or a host, I can share. Daniel, can you make her a co-host? If you go in participants and... Yeah, you and, should be able oh, to. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much. Let me... Okay, can everyone see my screen? Perfect, okay. All right, thank you so much for having me today. Um, so as Terry mentioned, my research generally focuses upon understanding the impact of work-related stressors on the health, well-being, and safety of employees. Um, and today I'm excited to present some science-based tips uh, for avoiding burnout during the pandemic. Okay, so there is no doubt that the coronavirus has led to major abrupt changes in our day-to-day -day life, right? So one of these changes is the large percentage of employees who have moved to remote work in recent months. Um, so for instance, um, if you take a look at the results of this Gallup survey here, um, you can see this is just from mid-March to the end of March, right? Just over the course of a couple weeks, uh, the percentage of American workers who are who moved to remote work went from 31% to about 62%, right? So this change was abrupt and um, it did not go smoothly for all, right? In fact, maybe it didn't go smoothly for many. And it's led to an array of unique stressors for employees across the country and across the world, of course. But we'll, I'll focus on um, the US today. So for instance, I think a lot of us feel like we are living Groundhog's Day, right? We're in that movie where we're just playing the same day over and over again, wake up at home, do all the same things, uh, and then go home and it just all starts over again, right? So definitely can feel like we're living that same day. Also, a lot of us are really, you know, struggling to balance our work and family responsibilities, right? So a lot of folks were abruptly put in this position where they had to try to get all of their work done at home while also managing maybe even more family related uh, responsibilities than before. Like, right? Many of them are trying to homeschool their kids or help them, their kids through their online learning while um, managing their work responsibilities. And also, childcare and daycare facilities are often closed, which makes it even worse, right? Um, in addition to that, there is overwork and difficulties detaching, getting away from our work, right? We're literally working in the same place where we're living and that can make it really difficult to turn off and disengage and relax and step away from our work. Another, mo or another uh, unique stressor is loneliness, right? Many folks are reporting that they feel socially isolated given the physical distancing required by the pandemic. And the last thing I'll mention is there are just so many uncertainties, right? A lot of sources of, of ambiguity as we continue to, to move through this pandemic. Many of us maybe feel like we're not getting enough information from our employers. Maybe some folks are feeling sense of job insecurity, right? And the list goes on. There's a lot of sources of ambiguity. And uh, as you might suspect, these stressors are associated with a number of negative psychological health outcomes, right? So here are some results from a survey done by McKinsey. Now I'll note that these results are for all Americans, not just remote workers, but um, I think it kind of il it illustrates this picture that you know everybody is feeling quite anxious, depressed, distressed, and even engaging in you know some sources of substance use to try to cope with this stress, right? So. What do we do? How do we even begin to try to cope and manage these different sources of stress? And really, how can we avoid burnout during this time? Well, um, here are some suggestions 
<laughs> um, based on research. So the first thing I'll mention is set boundaries, right? Working from home can produce feelings of role confusion, like everything is melding together between your work life and your non-work life, right? This can happen for everyone and may especially be the case for folks who are trying to balance work and family responsibilities, right? You might be thinking, am I supposed to be a mom right now or a coworker, right? It can be difficult during the day. Um, but maintaining structure around your workday as much as possible in terms of both time and space can help to alleviate some of those feelings of confusion. Um, so when it comes to time, I recommend designating start and end times, right? Whether it be nine to five, whether it be later noon to nine, if, you're, if your workplace allows that you know, time scheduling flexibility, but designate the start and end times and try to stick with, to them if possible. Because um, when we stick with them, then that provides us with some opportunities to try to detach from work. I know for me personally, right, it's really easy to just kind of keep going since I'm basically at the office already. Um, but creating that start time and end time is really important um, for setting those boundaries. Additionally, in terms of space, if possible, create a designated workspace at home, right? Um, having this designated workspace is important because um, it, again, it again creates some of that separation. If we have our desk, like in our bedroom, for instance, that can be really difficult psychologically to, to create those boundaries. There's a lot of overlap there. Um, so setting boundaries in terms of time and space. The second suggestion is taking a break or maybe even a micro break. So research suggests that taking designated breaks, including right your lunch break, but also short micro breaks of a few minutes can help us regain energy and focus during the day. Okay, so I'm talking even breaks of a few minutes sprinkled throughout the day can be very helpful. Um, my own research shows that cyber loafing, which is using the internet, usually at work for non-work purposes, but using the internet during work time for non-work purposes, can help employees recover from some stressful work events. So cyber loafing is usually considered this counterproductive work behavior, but my research finds that those short breaks can also be helpful in helping folks kind of cope with stress, regain some energy throughout the day. So go ahead and take a few minutes during the day to daydream, doze, or play Candy Crush, as long as it's just a few minutes, and then get back to work, right? So those micro breaks can be helpful. And additionally, research does show that taking those designated uh, lunch breaks is also very important for breaking up the day. And building off of that, I'm not sure if um, you are uh, familiar with what we call the Pomodoro technique, but I thought I'd throw that in here. So this kind of builds on this micro break idea, right? It's just a structured way to take these mini breaks. Um, so with the Pomodoro technique, you can first, you plan out your tasks, right? And decide how many Pomodoros you need. And then each Pomodoro is taking 25 minutes to work and then followed by a five minute break, right? And you technically should repeat the uh, Pomodoro four times and then you take a longer break and you just do that throughout the day for as many times as you need to get the work done, right? But the key, the idea here is taking those five minutes or those few minutes after a uh, um, period of work to be able to, you know, regroup, get your energy, get re-engaged, re and then you can start again. All right, the next tip is to mix things up, right? So working from home, it's easy to get stuck in a rut and feel like you're living the same day over and over again, right? That groundhog day phenomenon. Therefore, I recommend, you know, mixing things up by making changes to your daily routine, right? I'm talking small routine or small changes. And I'm not just talking about taking mini breaks. I'm saying even smaller things, right? Trying out a new coffee recipe, changing up your surroundings, right? Even just taking your laptop and working outside for a few minutes. A lot of research shows the rejuvenating benefits of being outside in nature for a few minutes each day. Um, sampling new music for your work sessions, right? It's all about just creating little bits of little changes to your um, scheduled routine to, to create a little bit of variety. And I, I think it's worth kind of sitting down and taking a moment to proactively think about what are the little changes that kind of just bring joy to your day. If it is just a new coffee recipe or something, right? Just we have to be a little bit 
more proactive, I think, in creating those like little bits of joy throughout the day um, during this, this time. Okay, my next tip is self-compassion is key. Okay, research consistently shows that self-compassion is associated with positive effects for health and well-being. So what is self-compassion? Well, we define it as the tendency to extend compassion and kindness toward oneself in instances of perceived inadequacies, failures, or general suffering. Right? I think I'm not the only one who can say that, you know, it's a lot easier to have a negative internal dialogue when we mess up, right? If I don't understand something or if I'm struggling, it's so easy to say, God, get it together. What are you doing? You need to just like get a hold of yourself. You know, you're failing, right? Just being really negative. But if somebody, if one of my good friends comes up to me and tells me that they feel like they failed or they feel like they're really struggling, I would never in a million years think to say those same things to my friend. Of course, I would say, you know, don't worry, you'll get through this. You are not your failures, right? And so self-compassion is literally treating yourself like with the same kindness and care that you would give a good friend. And self-compassion is really, we think of it as composed of three different components, right? There's self-kindness, so being warm and understanding towards ourselves when we fail, suffer, or feel inadequate, rather than ignoring our pain and criticizing ourselves. There's common humanity, which is recognizing that suffering and personal inadequacy is part of the shared experience. We all experience those feelings, and it's something we all go through. And then mindfulness, right? Observing our negative thoughts and emotions as they are with openness and clarity and without trying to suppress or deny them, right? And when we can engage in each of these three components of self-compassion, then we can experience positive outcomes and we are more resilient in the face of stressors. And my own research shows that self-compassion does help to reduce the impact of work-related loneliness on health outcomes during the pandemic. So we found that work Self-compassion reduces the link between work-related loneliness and depression, depression, right? And ample evidence also shows that self-compassion is a skill that can be learned and we can get better at it, okay? And so there's a lot of resources out there on self-compassion and you could go to um, selfcompassion.org. It's really small in the corner, but um, if you just Google self-compassion, it'll take you right to that website. And there's a lot of great resources for learning how to incorporate self-compassion into your, into your life. I think especially, especially key during this time. Um, the next tip is being proactive in creating safe social opportunities, right? So COVID-19 has unsurprisingly led to high levels of loneliness and isolation for many individuals. And because of the rapidly changing public health situation and people's varying levels of comfort with different types of social interaction, it's really important, more important than ever, to identify safe opportunities for social activity, right? Um, so it could be things like um, virtual activities, scheduling Zoom game nights, right? Um, organizing a video trivia contest, um, starting a group chat with your friends. Um, going back to game nights, I know I've had a couple, I don't know if any of you have heard of Jackbox games, but it's a really fun way to do some, some games through, the, uh, through Zoom. Uh, so we've had some good game night or some fun game nights there. So it's taking a I think it takes a little bit of effort to think of different ways to interact virtually, um, but I think there are a lot of opportunities. And then um, if trying to spend face-to-face -face time with other people, uh, with other people, you know, just make sure to take the necessary health precautions. Make sure you, of course, you're distanced and wearing your masks, um, but going for a walk outside, um, different, you know, thinking of different social opportunities is really key. And I think we have to be creative here but it's, it's more, than, and more important than ever um, because it, some say that, you know, loneliness is kind of the other pandemic during this time. And so it's really, really key to think of these social activities. Okay, and finally, I want to mention how important it is to take care of yourself, right? It's not selfish to ensure that you get enough sleep. One in three Americans don't get enough sleep. Um, so this is important to, th to think about, right? At least the seven hours. Exercise and proper nutrition, right? I also recommend, you know, keeping your home and workspace as organized as possible. I'm one to talk, but um, it can help 
um, with your mood and lead to fewer constraints throughout your day. And um, lastly, as I mentioned before, you know, tr really try to set time aside to detach and relax at the end of the workday. Re research shows that having our time to recover our mental resources at the end of the day is imperative for our health and well-being as it allows us to get re-energized and avoid burnout over time. Okay, and I also want to add a special note for working parents. So as you continue to juggle multiple responsibilities, you may be especially prone to feeling overwhelmed and exhausted. So it's particularly important for parents to dedicate energy to maintaining, you know, a balanced diet, finding time for themselves if possible. I know it's really, really difficult right now. Um, but I think of the example with the oxygen masks on an airplane, right? You need to take care of yourself in order to be able to take care of others. Um, if there's two parents in the home, it can be especially helpful to divide and conquer household duties um, to just be able to make sure that both parents are able to meet their work goals while also providing the necessary care for their children. Stephanie, I have a question on that. Sure. So one of your is to detach. And mm -hmm. I felt, and especially during quarantine, it's been even more hard to detach like screen time. And so I, everything I did at work was on the screen. We're eight hours a day. We're on the laptop. We're on Zoom. And then my social life, there's no social interaction anymore. It's virtual trivia nights. It's virtual, you know, meeting. And so I feel like since March, my screen time, including my laptop, has quadrupled. I mean, I don't even know what's bigger than quadruple, but it's 10 times bigger than what it ever has been. Do you have any suggestions for that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, it's true, right? It's, we have so much, especially Zoom, with so much interaction and so much as we were mentioning, seeing ourselves in the little screen. Uh, so I do think, you know, when possible, just sprinkle in um, if, po you know, distance interaction, I think is great as long as it's, you're able to completely maintain, you know, the distance. Um, but then I would also say other activities that maybe don't involve screens. So there's a great deal of research linking, you know, physical activity to not only health outcomes, but also helps us with our job performance. Um, so getting away from screens that way, spending time outside, a lot of research is showing that, you know, taking, for instance, there's a study in my, in my mind where it's like they did an experiment where um, folks took uh, nature or walks outside during their lunch break. And that was associated with higher engagement and energy um, for the rest of the work day. Um, so if there are activities that allow you to detach and relax without the screen, I do think that that's gonna be especially rejuvenating right now. Um, and again, I actually recommend, you know, t using this as an activity to really like write down, brainstorm different activities that you think are gonna give you energy and provide you with relaxation um, that might be different than, you know, just doing Zoom meetings or um, social interactions after work. So I think that's a great point. Any other questions? Well, so those are the tips I wanted to touch or to touch on. <laughs> so in summary, right, set boundaries, take a micro break, mix things up, engage in self-compassion, be proactive in creating safe social opportunities and treat yourself, aka give yourself self-care, right? So these, of course, are not the only strategies that you can use to avoid burnout. And also I realize some of these strategies may not be feasible for all and or may not be especially applicable if maybe you're working in an office instead of being at home all day. Um, but hopefully this presentation has been helpful and has taught you some useful tips for getting through this difficult time. So thank you so much and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I'm going to let some people kind of formulate some questions in their mind or if they want to put them on the chat box, but I'm going to throw one out at you. So yes. I've had some people talk about, they're using the term pandemic brain, which I'm sure will be studied a long time from now on. Mm -hmm. um, is it such, is pandemic brain such a thing? And, and for me personally, I find that I am more confused. I am more um, scattered. I can't seem to focus very well. 
um, I, you know, I feel like even like, it, you know, the work day is like, I feel like, oh, I've got to get this. Oh, wait a minute. I got to get this. I, I got to catch up on this. Um, and I didn't know whether this is a real thing or it's just me just getting old. No, it's definitely, definitely a thing because um, there are so many sources of stress coming at all different angles, right? So we have uh, pandemic related stress. We have work related stress. We have more family related stress. We're concerned about getting the, uh, the virus, right? There's all these unique factors. Some folks are worried about, you know, the economy. And of course we have all these other things. We have an impending election and all these different, right? There's all these different components that are coming together to create, I think, just so many sources and our, our brains can really only handle so much. It's so much activation um, that we're constantly dealing with. So um, yeah, I think it's just the accumulation of all those factors that are influencing our ability to manage. Uh-huh. I know that you mentioned about setting up a space about, you know, having a dedicated workspace. And I will tell you anecdotally, I am, um, I think we all started out working on our dining room tables. Everybody yes. started working on their dining room tables. And then there was a big, we all decided we were going to go buy, you know, you couldn't buy printers, you couldn't buy office chairs, you couldn't buy anything because they were all out of them. So I set up this really cute little workspace in a bedroom upstairs and it was so pretty and it was so nice. And then I found myself so isolated up there by myself because um, I, I live by myself except for the mm-hmm. two dogs. And I felt myself so isolated that I felt like I was in a cave and it was just really contributing to depression. So I moved everything back downstairs into a room that has light and a room that has, um, you know, I can see the street and I can see people go by and it really helped a lot. So even though that room was really pretty and cute, it helped to be out where I could actually see things going on. And that was helpful. Yes. That's a great point. Um, there is research showing that, you know, being able to be exposed to, for instance, the outdoors is definitely helpful. So if you can have a workspace that, especially if it has a window, that is key um, because it does kind of reduce some of those feelings of isolation. Um, but that's a good point, right? That not all workspaces are going to be, they're not, not all workspaces are equal, right? So you definitely have to create a space that works for you. I have a question. So maybe this pandemic happened seasonally, probably at one of the best times because we all had the summer to look forward to. We had warm weather coming. Now I'm in panic mode that I'm going to be stuck in my house for the next four months when it's 30 degrees and dark 24 hours a day and we don't have the outdoor options. Right now I can go outside and sit on my deck. I can grab a kayak and go kayaking on the weekends. I can do all these fun things. When are that doesn't happen? What are your suggestions? How can we help prevent wintertime, the depression that already happened, seasonal depression? Yeah, well, one um, strategy that I, I won't say I know all of the research on, but I know it is empirically based and helpful, or a lot of folks find this helpful, is what we call light therapy. Um, so you can actually purchase a light that is made to help provide you with the UV rays and the rays that you would get from the sun. It's um, found to be associated with um, some less of those kind of winter blues, right? It kind of reduces some of those depressive feelings that we might be experiencing during that time of year. Um, and then in addition, you know, I mean, I was actually just joking with my husband that in the middle of winter, he and I are going to wear our giant Eddie Bauer coats and just walk around in the winter because it's like we need to have that outdoor exposure. Um, I think it's really important to, again, kind of be creative. I mean, tr- as creative as possible, right? This is just like a There's no real solution, but we just have to think about different opportunities to get some outdoor exposure, um, have more exposure to at least windows, right? And have some of that natural light as much as possible because it's definitely a concern. Um, Yeah, I wish I had a better answer, but (laughs) hopefully that's helpful. So go buy, go buy one of those light lights now because they're probably going to be a run on them. <laughs> true. That's actually very true. Yeah. That'll be the next thing you won't be able to buy on Amazon because everybody, they'll all be gone. Mm-hmm. Does exactly. anybody else have any questions? Feel free to I just jump in. You question. don't have to type one, just feel, feel free. Yes, I do have a question. Sure. We are already in some sort of a fall season and winter is coming. If this prolong to into the winter and then even if we have outdoor space at home like backyard 
things like that. We cannot spend any time outdoor in the winter. Right. What is the best strategy to deal with this kind of weather condition? I mean, yeah, that's a great question. Um, it really, I, in terms of the weather, I'm not really, <laughs> I, I think that we just really have to try to, you know, spend as much time as we can around outdoor um, or with that natural light, right? Like spending time definitely working near windows if possible, I think is really key. That's one thing we can do have some control over. Um, and then, I mean, this isn't the best, ad, best, best answer, but I know, you know, getting the best winter, <laughs> winter clothes and getting outside because I, I really don't know. It's gonna be really, I think it's gonna be very difficult for many people in the winter time for sure. Do you, do you have any suggestions for, I know young professionals struggle sometimes with understanding what's going on in the world and then seeing their peers, their bosses, their mentors, not wearing the mask, not social distancing. Um, and I think I've, I continuously hear, I don't want to go to that event, but I'm being told I have to go. I, I need to be there because my job is making me, my friends are all going they're having a social life. I'm now excluded because I want to wear a mask and they're not. How do you navigate that as a young professional, especially if it's work related? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and that's something, you know, that's always kind of, that's, that's been an issue before, right? Having work um, pressure folks to do things that they're not comfortable doing, but that's especially apparent here. And I think a lot about the folks too, who are, you know, working on the front lines and feel forced to go to work when, you know, and they don't feel comfortable. I wish I had, you know, the best, a, a great answer. I think really just um, reaching out, you know, there's hopefully some other, some folks in your, you know, if, if you're in that situation, there's folks in your network who are engaging in the social distancing and things so you can lean on them for kind of some emotional support because it really, it's, it's, you know, you, you raise a great point. Like there's a lot of pressure to, to kind of ignore some of these things if we're in social networks where folks are ignoring them and then also the workplace. I mean, with the workplace, it's tough. Um, finding kind of an ally within the workplace that would be helpful, especially if they have, um, if they're, you know, kind of have some, some pull in the organization or in a, a higher level of the organization who might be able to speak for you on your behalf um, to kind of make some changes possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really is tricky. Uh, wish I had a better answer, but. Do you find that um, because we're quarantined at home, that people aren't taking vacations as they should be taking vacations because there's no place to go? Because they yes. can't really travel. So they're not, people, people aren't taking vacations enough. I know we had to turn in our PTO you know, for work. And I looked at the calendar and went, I haven't, I haven't taken a day off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah. We're not anywhere. Um, and what possibly could, you know, how, you know, how do you do that? And especially people with families and kids in school and, you know, what's yeah. your advice to those people? Yeah. You know, if possible, I would still take those days off if possible, right? Because I think a lot of those days are going to go unused, like those, um, those days off, the vacation days. Mm -hmm. um, and even though it might seem silly to take the day off, even if you're not going anywhere, it's really important to have that break if possible. And also thinking about some creative ways to maybe go on some kind of staycation if it's in your you know, financial means or if you have the time, right? Um, so for instance, um, you know, we've taken a trip, we just took a little trip to the Smoky Mountains, and we actually still, we still did some work, but that was helpful to just change the scenery and kind of was rejuvenating to take a break during this time that didn't require travel among others, right? We're able to just kind of take a cabin and go and do our own thing. But I think being, taking those proactive breaks, whether it be the little breaks throughout the day, bigger lunch breaks, or even day breaks, right? Taking those actual um, mm -hmm. days off for vacation is really key because otherwise the burnout is just, it's going to be inevitable. And I think we're already feeling that and it's just going to make it worse if you don't take those breaks. Terry, I'll add to that something that we've seen since this all started at the chamber 
is people are calling the Chamber of Commerce saying, what are your travel restrictions? What businesses have outdoor seating? Um, and so when I traveled back in the middle of all of this, I had to take a trip. I, I called the local Chamber of Commerce and I said, what locations are taking this seriously? And they gave me a list and they said, don't go to these restaurants. Don't go to these places. And they were, I mean, they were taking ownership for the places that were doing it. They also let us know travel restrictions, what to expect, what not to expect. So you can make traveling safe. And like Steph said, she traveled, she did a very, we, she quarantined, but there are people at, in every community that are willing to share experiences too. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great resource is to reach out to the chamber and get those, the list of those restaurants. I know my own experience of definitely there have been places that I've walked out of because I just did not feel comfortable. And then it's just so nice to be able to go somewhere where, you know, they are taking your temperature and they're taking the distancing, mm -hmm. um, you know, seriously. Uh, it just makes for a better experience for everybody, I think. So that's really great. It's a great resource. I think it's, it's interesting. I did travel um, at the end of June. I went to Tybee doing, you know, of course they were limiting the restaurants, how many people were there, you had to make reservations, but every restaurant took your temperature. I don't see that here in this area doing that, um, but, yeah. every, but every restaurant was taking your temperature before you went in. I know that we probably have some, um, some moms here who have some school age ki kids. What's your advice for working at home, dealing with the pandemic, children going to school, homeschool? I, cannot even imagine what that must be like for parents. Yeah, I mean, it is difficult. Uh, I don't have the perfect answer, but I, you know, some things is definitely lean on your no network as much as possible, right? In terms of emotional support and instrumental support as possible, right? Um, working together is key. And then also, you know, because, there are just so many responsibilities, right? Um, that the stress might not go away right away. <laughs> um, so I think also just really doing yourself or giving yourself the gift of the self-compassion, I think is really key. Um, you know, it is so hard, essentially impossible to do. It, it is impossible to do everything, right? There's so much, so many responsibilities, so many demands. And so I think, um, it's really important to acknowledge that you're not alone and it's not you. You're not a failure for, you know, feeling like you can't meet all the demands. You're just being dealt in ridiculous um, uh, hand right now. Um, and so I think keeping that in mind and keeping that perspective is really important. Any other questions in there? I know that at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we, it, it, ironically, it was Friday, March the third, Friday the 13th, March yeah. the 13th was our last day at work. And, um, and then we were home from them. And there were some really dark days in there when you could, the uncertainty, I think all of us dealing with the uncertainty of what it's going to come and then settling in and realizing this is what our life is going to be like. Um, mm -hmm. I did a lot of cleaning those early days. Um, I have never cleaned so many closets and drawers and, and I, you know, I think I single-handedly contributed to the landfill in many ways, getting rid <laughs> of stuff and Goodwill got a lot of stuff, but, um, and, and so Roxy, that's what I do in the winter time is I've, I've got another closet I'm saving up to clean when the weather is cold. And then, um, so I, I went through the cleaning phase and then I went through the online shopping phase and now I have another <laughs> closet. So now I need to clean out again. Well, the, the struggle thing, is real. The yeah. bad thing about the online shopping thing is, is like I, I would do online shopping and I realized I don't need any clothes because I'm not going anywhere. So yes. Like, you know, there's no shopping. I did buy some house things, you know, but it's like, okay, slow down because no one, you know, you're not going to see these things. But, um, you know, everybody was baking bread and everybody was doing those things and, you know, struggling the best that we can. And I think it's just the uncertainty and not knowing, you know, how long this is going to last, when we're going to be able to go when life's going to change. I don't know that we'll ever be back to normal, um, but that uncertainty has certainly there. And I think it was the weekends that got me the most the, because it would be um, during the weekday I was working, you know, had work stuff going on. And then the weekends, it was like, I got nothing going on now. And I'm mm -hmm. just like, ready to, yeah. 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 I think creating a structure, some kind of structure as much as possible is helpful. And um, 
you know, there's this idea of what we call leisure crafting. So it's crafting your leisure time to, um, to fulfill the needs that you're not getting from your work. And I think a lot of times our work is like, especially right now, there's a lot of monotony, we're at home, right? Um, so I think uh, kind of crafting that time off um, to, for instance, if you're not getting, if you feel like you're, you don't, you're not in control during your work day, then try to think of some activities that allow you to kind of exercise, get feel autonomy and feel control. Um, or if you feel like your work is just really, really stressful, then kind of think of what are some activities that I've been wanting to do to try to re relax, right? I personally started knitting, which I don't know if that's actually really less, not stressful because it's kind of hard, but <laughs> getting there. But thinking of those different activities um, that really are giving, kind of fulfilling the needs that you might not be getting in your work day, I think is, it's kind of a good way to think about it. And you, you think that we would kind of have it down to a technique now, having been in this sort of mode for a while, but, you know, I was talking to my supervisor the other day that it, it's so, it, it makes a, our work day is more complicated with the layers of trying to figure technology and trying to figure out how to do it this way instead of this way. And it used to be that we could just go to each other's office door and say, hey, you know, ask a question or whatever. Well, we can't go to each other's office door anymore. We have to rely on when we see each other virtually or send each other an email, which I don't know about the rest of you. It seems like our emails have exploded in correspondence. And sometimes it's hard to keep up with all of those because we correspond so much more with email. I don't know if the rest of you feel that way or not, if that's something that's just, I feel like I, you know, have so much more email correspondence now. Um, yeah. And I have so few phone call correspondence now. Everybody wants to either be an email or Zoom. And I'm like, we still have this technology of a phone call. I don't need to look at your face to tell you what we're about to do. So I don't, I feel like I haven't had a phone call. Somebody called my office today and I thought, oh, I haven't heard your voice in so long. And because we've been in Zoom meetings. Yeah. Yeah, I think definitely. I mean, I know we don't always have as much control over it, but as much as possible, reducing the, you know, if you don't need to use the video chat, I think keeping that for, you know, longer and more maybe important meetings, I think is key. Um, so kind of making sure that you're using kind of the least mediated form of communication for important things. Um, but sometimes, you know, a little message is all that you need. Um, and so I think just being mindful of it, that not everything, not every touch base that you have with each person in your workplace needs to be a Zoom meeting. I think that is okay. Cause it definitely, there is a thing, you know, Zoom fatigue is real too. Um, and I think that's also going to be a topic that is thoroughly researched mm -hmm. during this time. Yep. Well, any other questions or comments that you want to put our way? I think I've learned a lot from you guys and, and I feel like... <laughs> I don't feel alone because I feel like a lot of us have the same issues going on, um, both personally in the workplace, you know, working at home. We just all have to hang in there together and be glad that we have Zoom because if this had been 10 years ago, we wouldn't have had this technology <laughs> that we right. have now. So yeah. I want to thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much for being here. This has been very helpful for us and we truly appreciate it. I want to thank Roxy and Hype for their help with all of this. Um, Thank you so much. It's always good to have you, that your, your young, enthusiastic minds and, and ideas in there. And thank you, Oyland, for all your help with this as well. Um, our next Adulting 101 is October 21st, and I will share my screen here so you can see the, uh, the, uh, um, the, hopefully you can see it. October 21st at six o'clock on Zoom. Um, we're, the registration will be at the same Eventbrite site. We're gonna do something a little different and give you a password to get in. The topic will be big spender, building credit and making big purchases. And we'll be doing that so it's sort of right in time for getting ready to shop for the holidays and um, buying all those wonderful Christmas gifts. So planning on that. So. Thank you once again. Information will go out for our next one. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell any IU alum, and thank you all very, very much. So y'all take care out there. We're all in this thank together, right? Thank, thank you. you so much for having thank me. You. All righty. Bye-bye.